Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is peregrine falcons and with us is Bert Myers, Director of Environmental Education for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Hi, Bert, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Beth. It's a pleasure to be here. I think we need your camera on if you can flip that switch for us so we can see you. There you go. Good to see you. So Likewise. tell us a little bit about about tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at the DEP. Currently, I am Director of Environmental Education, as you mentioned, for the Department of Environmental Protection. We have a variety of programs that come out of our office, including the DEP Environmental Education Grant Program, the Teaching Green Newsletter, and we provide professional development for educators. And uh, the Peregrine Falcon is also falls under our office. We have the um, DEP Falcon Cam, which is 24-7, uh, uh, and can be accessed by our webpage. And on there, there are four cameras on the 15th floor ledge that uh, um, capture what's going on with the Falcons. And uh, as far as my background goes, I've had a long career at the Commonwealth. I began with uh, DCNR in the Bureau of State Parks at Colonel Denning State Park. And then I was, after that, I was at uh, Gifford Pinchot State Park for a year. And then I had the opportunity to go to work for the Game Commission as an educator at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area. I imagine we have some birders on this call and uh, Middle Creek is quite the birding destination. So I'm sure they're familiar with that area. And then five years ago is when I came to DEP and in my current position. You've really had some great opportunities to view birds in your different locations. But the, is the Rachel Carson building one of the most unique spots you've had to view birds? It certainly is, and it is because of the setting. This is an urban setting. You know, it's the time when you're thinking of terms of birding. Uh, for example, I was down at Cape May recently, and you know, you're outside. You know, you're exploring the the edges of the beach or whatever. Uh, in uh, the case of the Rachel Carson State Office Building Falcons, you're downtown Harrisburg, so that is a completely different dynamic. Well, while you get your presentation presentation ready. I'm going to remind the audience that if anyone has a question about today's topic, please type it into the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can when he is completed. So Bert, if you're ready, tell us about the Peregrine Falcon. So this uh, presentation is on the Peregrine Falcon and its restoration recovery in Pennsylvania, but I also wanted to provide some insight into the nest at the Rachel Carson State Office Building. So where I like to start is just the classification. Peregrine fal falcons belong to the raptor family or birds of prey, which includes eagles, ospreys, harriers, hawks, and owls. So falcons are classified with the hawks and there's two types of hawks, including the occipiters and the budios. So on the left, you see the uh, sharp shinned hawk and on the right is the red tail hawk, which are both members of the hawk family. Now, Fal falcons are appropriately named. Falca peregrinus is, means wandering falcon. These birds uh, do migrate um, and they migrate in some cases from as far as the mid-Atlantic states down to northern South America. Uh, they are also the fastest animal in the animal kingdom and having reached speeds well over 200 miles an hour. Um, as you can see here, they're not very big. 15 to 20 inches in height and wingspans from 38 to 46 inches. Top uh, heavy bird would be two and a half pounds. And I think it's important to understand that in uh, peregrine falcons and all birds of prey, uh, in terms of sexual dimorphism, how to sell, tell male from female, females are 30 to 50% bigger than the males. And in our case, our current female is significantly larger than 85 AK, the current resident male peregrine falcon. So in terms of identification, uh, you can take a look at the picture on the far right and you can see that um, black wedge extending below the eye. I like to jokingly refer to that as the Elvis sideburn. And that's a really good field mark. Also in the field, they are built for speed. So they're very narrow winged and uh, uh, very narrow body designed for aerodynamics. Uh, they are one of three species of falcon found within the Commonwealth. I'm showing pictures of the other two. On the far left is the Merlin, 
which is a little smaller than peregrine falcon, about the size of a pigeon. And then even smaller is the more common American kestrel, or what some people used to refer to as a sparrow hawk. Uh, those are the three falcon species found within Pennsylvania. So what led to the decline and the eventual listing of the peregrine falcon as an endangered species was one, direct persecution at one time. Uh, birds of prey were not protected by law. They were not protected by the Migratory Bird Act nor the game code. Of course, that has long since changed and um, um, actually shooting at or you know, harvesting of a uh, raptor is a violation of federal and state law. And then the bigger picture, lies in the DDT era. DDT was a, a, a pesticide that was used, um, overly used, I should say, in the post-World War II era. And it was spread indiscriminately over neighborhoods, over wetlands, over a variety of habitats. And it got into the food chain, into the reproductive chain of the peregrine falcon in the terms of their eggs, like many other raptors, were thin-shelled and weak, and they would break. And so therefore, the reproduction went way down. And by 1960, the majority of the eastern peregrine falcon population was gone. But there was um, an important timeline. Uh, first, in 1970, is when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service placed peregrine falcons on the endangered list, the federal endangered list. Two years later, DDT was officially banned. And then it began the reintroduction program. The first locations were uh, natural cliff sites, but there was major issues with predation by great horned owls. And so peregrine falcon release sites moved to more coastal areas outside of Pennsylvania and into urban areas such as Harrisburg. Uh, there are also nests in the Philadelphia area in Pittsburgh and around the state in urban areas. Uh, they are nesting on uh, skyscrapers, tall buildings, smokestacks, and uh, bridges a variety of uh, urban type um, nest sites. So the reintroduction and restoration was successful and they were removed as a federal endangered species in 1999. And last year is when the uh, Pennsylvania state list was updated and removed not only from the endangered species list, but the threatened species list. And that's not to say that the peregrine falcon is still not protected by law. Because as I referenced earlier, the um, Migratory Bird Act and also the game code protect peregrine falcons. So I wanted to switch to the Rachel Carson State Office building, uh, appropriately named building, which I'll talk about a little later. But on the photo on the left, you can see the location of the actual ledge and just some pictures of the adults to give you an idea of not only um, in the field identification, but also in terms of they are amazing flyers. They have incredible um, ability to change directions in flight, and uh, they are very precise with their dives. Um, they're just a remarkable bird. So the project with, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Let me do that again. The project began in 96 when one male peregrine falcon was spotted in downtown Harrisburg. So efforts were to establish a breeding pair on the Rachel Carson State Office building placement of a nest site and a nest box. A hybrid female from the National Shrine was captured early in the reintroduction program. It was hard to find um, wild peregrine falcons. So in some cases, the um, domesticator hybrid females were used, but being a hybrid, she was not um, fertile. So therefore it began in April when a new female arrived and by the year 2000, nesting success had been established and has been going on continuously ever since. Um, so as I mentioned in 99, the original female was infertile and within two weeks, the male returned with the new female banded 4-4 and for four years, the season paired, uh, this pair nested successfully. And unfortunately, in 04, the male peregrine falcon was injured along the rail line that's across the street from the Rachel Carson building. In 205, a new male, WV, arrived exhibiting courtship behaviors, and the pair successfully fledged three young. That's a picture of um, WV on the right, and I'll be referencing this special bird again. Um, so in 210, uh, a new 
a female arrived and began buying with the male, and we never did determine what happened to the, the female banded 4-4. Um, 2012, after a sustained an eye injury, the resident female was incapacitated. In early June, a new female, 48 AE, was reserved, pair bonding with WV, and she has been the breeding female ever since 2012. So they had a long, uh, um, successful um, nesting period for seven years, producing a lot of young. And that's a testimony to an amazing bird. WV was displaced last year as the dominant male by 85 AK. And he was remarkably old for a peregrine falcon. Uh, in most literature, it lists 16 as the outer edge of age groups. And WV began breeding at age two a year earlier than most falcons. And he, in his lifetime, sired 54 young, which successfully fledged or flew. And there are six offspring that nested, producing 160 grandchildren, with three grandchildren occupying known nesting sites. And that's also a tribute to banding, so we can identify individual birds and where they originated from. So this new male is 85 AK, uh, originally hatched in Baltimore in the Transamerica building, one of four siblings whose mother, 09 AR, came from Pennsylvania. And... Last year was the first year of breeding for 85 AK on the Rachel Carson building. So um, an update right now, right now we are on five eggs. Uh, three more have added since I developed this. The first egg was laid on March 7th, which was the earliest by two days in the history of the nest site. So we got as many as five, we did. And the next thing to be looking for is what's known as pipping. That's when the um, the the young falcons inside the egg use their egg tooth, which really isn't a tooth, and will fall off. They start breaking through the egg, and you start seeing little holes emerges in the eggs, and that's an indicator that it's about to hatch. That could happen as early as this weekend. So I would really recommend you tuning in. Give you a bit of a timeline. On um, February, the nesting season begins. The eggs did arrive in March. April, once the uh, eggs hatch, we're going to have a nest box filled with little fuzzy falcons, and uh, they will continue to develop. In May, we hope to work with the Game Commission again in banding these young birds, which we do uh, as expediently as we can and with as little disruption as possible. In June is Falcon Watch and Rescue, which is an opportunity for volunteers if you're interested. And during the remaining part of the summer, the uh, young are improving their flight skills, which is remarkable because this months earlier, they had just hatched. Uh, they will uh, disperse in August. That means, or uh, they will extend their flights in August. And in September, they will disperse. And disperse means they will be leaving for their own nest site. And there could be migration going on too. They might move to coastal areas. Uh, they've, we have nest sites that are in Ohio, Maryland, and other mid-Atlantic states that originated from birds from the Rachel Carson building. And then they really wander in the wintertime. So as I mentioned, we had five eggs this year. Typically, it's three. Incubation and care is divided between male and female. Though the female does the majority of the nest sitting. Um, the proper name for a young falcon is an ias, and they shed their down feathers and are flying within 40 to 45 days of age, which is remarkable. Migrations during the winter, and generally the juveniles, they do not return to the ledge. Once they're gone, they're gone for good. Um, fa peregrine falcons are bipyrenal. That means that both parents tend to the young, but primarily the female tends to the eggs and incubates them, and the male, his primary function is providing prey. Uh, this is, is a common form of parenting for most monogamous birds. Um, and this is pretty much the role of the male and the female. So this is what they're going to look like here in about another few days, a week. Uh, you can see on the left, that is an urban nest site. On the right is a wild site. Uh, you can see that they're remarkably similar. There's no sign of any nesting or any sticks or anything added to the nest. It's just a depression. So historically, falcons nested on steep cliff sides, typically under an overhang. But today, the majority of falcons nest on human-made structures. And on cliff sides, the females would dig the shallow depression, as I described, and as you can see in the picture in the lower left. The, upper, the picture in the upper right is very similar to what's going on right now. Uh, prior to the season, I will go out on the ledge and um, 
make sure that the nest box is ready. Here I'm adding some more materials, some uh, gravel to the box. You can see the uh, camera in the background is above my head. And I can assure you it's quite a view from that uh, ledge for the capital of Harrisburg. Then I often ask young people, oh, you want to be a wildlife biologist? How's your sense of heights? So here you see a game commission biologist on the left, Dan Browning, who recently retired, scaling the, uh, a cliff to get down to a nest site. Here's a, a person that was helping him that day, actually getting the birds ready to band. This is another example of a cliff site and access to that can be a bit of a challenge as you can see. Um, then you have the urban sites. This is the Walt Whitman Bridge in Philadelphia. And you can see in the photo on the right, there's a falcon perched there. Their falcon watch and rescue when the birds are fledging is actually quite different than ours in the sense that people are in kayaks and canoes and literally paddling underneath the bridge in case these birds in their first flight uh, end up in the water. They can rescue them, dry them out and get them back to the nest site for let them to try again. And typically the fledglings, their first flights, they're not very strong. So other sites have their own type of uh, challenges. This is a bridge on Route 30 between York and Lancaster County. And you see that they adapted this uh, pontoon boat to be able to access the underside of the bridge where the uh, nest is located at. And so that's how they're able to uh, band in unique situations like this. So the Falcon events uh, coming up, we'll do the Falcon banding. Uh, we're hoping to be able to share that uh, online. Um, it's used for research purposes and identification. Uh, the Game Commission, we work closely with that uh, wildlife agency in handling the birds. ISs are taken off the ledge band and return quickly. Uh, just as a side note, on the right in that photo, you might recognize Secretary of DCNR Cindy Adams Dunn who was our celebrity bander that year. And the individual on the left is Dr. Art McMorris with the Pennsylvania Game Commission who just retired. He said he wasn't gonna retire until birds were delisted from the state list that occurred. And I wish Art all the best. Um, so the Watch and Rescue will be coming up in late May. It looks like early June for this year. Um, we have um, DEP, DCNR employees and volunteers. So if you're interested in your birder, uh, from dusk to dawn, the uh, ledge is monitored. We set up across the street and with other volunteers using spotting scopes and binoculars, just watch these birds when they fledge. When the young uh, falcons are flying for the first time, they can get themselves in predicaments that aren't safe, especially in an urban area. So we are there in case we need to perform a rescue, which we'll do and return the uh, Falcon to the roof of the Rachel Carson State Office building to let them try again. And eventually they get it. Um, there have been birds that have been lost, but most of the time our success rate in fledging has been pretty strong. So here's some pictures from the banding event. You can see the biologist out on the uh, ledge and he's removing an IS in one photo on the far right. Uh, we have to be very careful with the adults. They um, are uh, very defensive of their nest. So we actually use, uh, have another person holding a broomstick, uh, a broom backwards and up uh, above the uh, head of the biologist and the, the adults tend to head towards that and leave the biologist alone. At least that's the idea. And banding is very important. Here you see on the left, uh, the banding of a kestrel, but it's essentially the same process. Uh, these bands are numbered and they are by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Each bird gets an individual uh, federal band and they also be banded with colored bands. So when the fledging does occur during watch and rescue, we can tell one fledging from the other. So they might be banded yellow or green or blue or something like that on the other leg. And that allows us to track them better. During Falcon Watch, Rescue, what you're seeing here is a rescue after we've actually captured the bird in a uh, urban part of uh, Harrisburg that wasn't safe. And you can see this bird was quite healthy. We check them out and if they seem fine, we will release them up on the roof or on the ledge. If they're not fine, then we will take them to a rehabilitator, get them looked at by professionals. So if you've never been to Falcon Cam, it's to see this uh, in action is right at your fingertips. Um, it's viewing in real time, you'll see behaviors, the development of the young, and different calls from alarm to feeding calls. They are quite vocal birds.
And also we provide Falcon Wire, and that is a network of stories and updates on what's going on uh, on the ledge. And uh, I'm actually the ghost writer. And uh, try to provide updates at least weekly. This time of year, they tend to be a little more um, uh, reoccurring. Uh, they reoccur more commonly. And then there's the Rachel Carson connection. Hopefully the majority of all of you know that have tuned into this presentation who Rachel Carson is. Um, she is Pennsylvania's own. And um, that the uh, building that I work in where my office is, has uh, been named for her. And as I mentioned, since uh, I mentioned in the text here, as of 2021, 79 eggs have hatched with the highest fitness rate of any site in the Commonwealth. What that means is we've produced more young and fledged successfully more young than any other spot, any other nest site within the Commonwealth. And these nestlings have been spotted nesting across the United States, as I mentioned, in Baltimore, Wilmington, Delaware, Cleveland, Ohio. But more on Rachel Carson, um, she had a monumental impact on environmental awareness with the publishing, publication of her work, um, Silent Spring. And this warned the scientific community of the impact and dangers of pesticides and DDT specifically. And it's just fitting that while well, once gone or near gone, species should nest on a building named after her legacy. And she's also remarkable in the sense that a woman in the post-World War II area up into the early 60s in the scientific community often had a tough road to hoe. And uh, there was a lot of scientists and of course, corporations that were trying to dispute her work. But in the end, it was confirmed by a committee organized by then President Kennedy and accepted as this is the line, this is the stance of the federal government. So a remarkable lady came from Western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. Also wanted to share some uh, great pictures of the birds in flight. As again, you can see on the left, how quickly they can change directions. And on the right, that's the appearance they have just before they enter a dive. And when they will tuck their wings in and pull in the tail feathers and they're essentially shaped almost like a missile. Some other pictures of peregrine falcons. I had to add one more of WV just to honor his legacy. Just a remarkable bird and uh, had a remarkable run at the Rachel Carson State Office building. Picture on the left, I will confess the keeping from my days at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area. Uh, that's also an area that you can see birds during the migration period. Uh, the first wild peregrine falcon I ever saw was at Middle Creek during a midwinter waterfowl survey. And I was working with uh, another Game Commission employee, and we saw a peregrine falcon chasing a pair of ringneck ducks across the lake. Uh, understand that falcons at one time were referred to as the duck hawk because they eat birds, and that includes ducks. And those diving ducks, the ringneck ducks, they dove, and the falcon we were observing missed and went out to a, a snag and began preening. And we were just like, did we just see what we thought we saw? I think that's a peregrine falcon. Oh my gosh, that is a peregrine falcon, which at the time was pretty rare. And so it's just a remarkable story of a remarkable covery of an icon of the environmental movement, Rachel Carson warning the community and warning the public about the ill effects of DDT. And then various federal and state agencies combining forces with other groups to reestablish the peregrine falcon within North America and to the success we are have reached today, including the delisting from federal and state endangered or threatened lists. So again, some, a couple more pictures of the peregrine falcon on the left is another photo taken from uh, Middle Creek. You can see that this bird is banded. And so with a good pair of binoculars or a spotting scope, it is possible to identify that bird. And on the right is uh, just a typical scene of the males that like to hang out near the corner of the uh, ledge. And you'll find the remains of many lunches and breakfasts there, which is essentially feathers. I thought an appropriate way to close this part of the program was to quote Ra Rachel Carson. And I think it's a great experience for everybody, but especially young people 
is to open your eyes to what is outdoors and to see it for yourself. And so one way to open your eyes is to ask yourself, what if I've never seen this before? What if I knew I'd never see it again? That would be something that you would forever cherish if you saw it for the first time. You know, with the way peregrine falcons are, they are sort of hit or miss at times. And uh, to see one in the wild within Pennsylvania is, is quite an achievement. So if there's any questions um, that I can answer at this point, I would be uh, um, ready and willing. Great. So uh, you covered a lot of important information, not just about the Falcons, but about environmental concerns and successes, which is appropriate given that Earth Day is recognized this month. So for the audience, the links for the Falcon Cam and the DEP website are in the chat box. So Bert, let's have you answer some questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is, would you explain how the names numbers are given to each of the Falcons? Um, it, it depends a lot on what year they're banded. Um, the biologist that does the banding, they're issued by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Geological Survey, uh, a string of bands that are numbered sequentially. So that biologist is using that, those bands during the course of one season. And so it goes in sequential. Let's say you banded a, they banded a bird in Allentown. And then the next series, the next uh, band on that um, series would go on the next bird that they banned. So it's, it has a lot to do with um, A, uh, when they're banded, what year they're banded, but also has to do with uh, male and female. There are different size bands depending on the sex. The female being larger, they get a larger band and the um, uh, smaller bands go on the male. And they are designed to fit the ISs uh, in a way that's comfortable so it doesn't bother them and they carry them for life. What type of data is gathered through the banding program? Well, banding can al allow us to identify specific birds. So, for example, in that uh, uh, example I shared in Baltimore, because that female was banded, that would be 85 AK, our current male's mother, uh, we could determine exactly where she was from, and she was banded uh, outside of uh, Allentown. And so that allows us to uh, identify specific birds. So the birds I know are competing with other birds for prey, but what mm -hmm. animals would be predators for the peregrine falcon? Well, as I mentioned in my presentation, in the natural sites, the great horned owl, some refer to as the tiger of the forest, is the top candidate. Uh, owls, um, the great horned owl specifically, they uh, prey on a variety of wildlife, um, including other owls. Uh, I was in the field when we came across a barn owl that uh, great horned owl had gotten to and so that was the primary predator and is to this day in natural sites in the urban areas there really is not uh, a lot of uh, uh, predators uh, the predators in Harrisburg for example are more likely of the four-wheeled variety as opposed to a feathered variety and because oh. their location uh, mammals really don't have a chance to get onto that ledge it's too it's, it's in, inaccessible Within Harrisburg, what other predators are competing for the food that's here? Well, that's another good question. Um, I referred to uh, a hawk early in my presentation, the sharp shinned hawk, and there's also the Cooper's hawk. Both of them prey almost exclusively on birds, and they tend to feed on songbirds. They might be, if, if you have a bird feeder and you're seeing a hawk coming in and plucking off a, a songbird here or there, that's likely one of those two. And as um, their prey being birds, that they are probably the closest to a, a peregrine falcon. So we've talked a little bit about Harrisburg. We have a question about where can falcons be seen in Philadelphia? Well, um, the Walt Whitman Bridge is uh, one site that has been um, a nest site for many uh, years. So going to the um, areas in and around the uh, harbor can be a good area. Um, as to the other locations in Philadelphia, I'd have to um, dive into the, that data a little deeper. So I know you've mentioned the success of the reintroduction program. Mm -hmm. What's the population level like at this point for peregrine falcons? One of, our, one of the listeners said that she did not, she's never seen one in the wild and wondered how many are out there. Um, 
Uh, I'm sorry. What was the question again? How many uh, falcons are uh, in the yeah. current population? Um, right now, we look in terms of nest sites, and there's over 45 west sites. So they have basically exceeded what the population level was prior to DDT. So that's why they, they were delisted at the federal and state level. So you talked, you meant, just mentioned the nests, and this question is one that I had as well. How do the eggs on the Rachel Carson building stay warm in a nest of gravel? That goes to the female primarily. Her incubation period, she is on those eggs just about 24 seven. Occasionally she'll take some breaks, but uh, when that occurs, oftentimes the male will jump in and he'll continue to incubate. So it's a continuous biparental um, effort. That's, that is amazing because there are some very cold days out there in March when these eggs are out there. So another question about the falcons. You mentioned that the young falcons leave the nest in only 45 days. How does mm -hmm. this compare with other raptor young fledglings uh, that I guess uh, they're, in the nest? They're, they're pretty similar. That, that 45 um, day period, sometimes it could be 40, maybe a little more than that up to 50 or so. But for the most part, when it comes to raptors, they're, they're all pretty close. Are there current penalties for interacting with falcons or their nests on buildings or is it there only are. in the wild? Okay. Um, no matter whether they're on a building or if they're in the wild, um, the game code protects um, species such as the peregrine falcon, other raptors from nest disturbances. Um, of course, you can't collect eggs or anything like that. Um, and just the best policy is just to observe with binoculars at a distance. And if you get too close, the uh, falcons will start um, verbalizing. They'll be starting to make some noise. When you hear that, you are too close. So I would back off. Well, that leads into another question. Uh, one of the listeners has uh, recently moved to the area and is interested in bird watching. And what should they have to assist them in a falcon watch? It sounds like distance is the best thing. Uh, can be. Um, let's see here. What you need to assist with really is a pair of good binoculars. You might okay. want to pair, bring a bird guide, but we'll fill you in on uh, what you're looking at. And uh, we do a, a webinar training for our volunteers to get everybody prepared. There is, um, you know, operating procedures that we have to work with that uh, are part of the protection of the peregrine falcon. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that one of the birds was a hybrid female. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about what that means? Well, there's multiple subspecies of peregrine falcons. And early in the um, reintroduction program, they were trying to find just about any peregrine falcon they could to use for breeding purpose to incubate eggs, some of them done uh, by humans. And those hybrids oftentimes came from falconers. Falconers is a um, a way to hunt with birds of prey. It's legal in Pennsylvania. It requires extensive training and extensive ap apprenticeship, but um, their birds in some cases were used to help jumpstart the peregrine falcon population. And some of those birds that falconers owned were bred between two different subspecies led to their being hybrids and not fertile. So the offspring of the birds, um, that are on the Rachel Carson building. Are they banded before they leave the area as well and tracked? Yes. Yeah, okay. when we do the banding event, they're they're really young. The, um, we give them a couple of weeks to get that growth spurt. And then to a certain point, the, the width of their foot and leg doesn't grow anymore. And that's when we're trying to time the banding. So it, it all coordinates with the size of the band and the size of the bird. Are people allowed to keep falcons as a pet? Are there policies regarding that? There are policies. That's uh, a, a good question for the Game Commission. Um, you can't really keep them as pets. There are special permits that rehabilitators might have. There's also permits required if you're a falconer. Um, I would not think that these birds would make a good pet. Um, I've um, been around birds of prey enough that uh, generally they have a bad attitude towards people. And uh, I can assure you that their talons and their, uh, their beak are very sharp. Yeah, I think they could let you know quickly that they were unhappy. 
So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you have any information on the smokestack peregrine that was seen in Erie, Pennsylvania a few years ago? I, my understanding is that's still an active nest. I would have to, again, take a deeper dive into the nest locations that are current, but um, I suspect that they're still nesting in that area. Erie in that area has a long history of successful uh, raptor populations uh, returning to the area. Um, early in the days of the bald eagle restoration, uh, it was generally agreed that the last bald eagle nest site within Pennsylvania, one of the few left was in Erie in the Presque Isle area. And so that, um, that area, because the uniqueness and its um, uh, proximity to the Great Lakes and Lake Erie, obviously, uh, is, a, is great habitat for peregrine falcons. They are also seen, uh, like I mentioned, Cape May burning down there recently. That's a species that you definitely want to be looking for uh, in late, uh, late winter, early spring, as they will move into coastal areas as well. So uh, that uh, name, uh, peregrine, meaning wandering, uh, is really appropriate. So final question, what can mm -hmm. we do to support the current bird population? What can we do to support peregrine falcons at this point? Um, I think the one thing would be to uh, um, respect nest sites when you're, if you're a wildlife watcher or if you're a peregrine falcon watcher and you get into an, an area that has some access is to respect the, those birds. Um, I would also suggest that um, you can support um, organizations like, well, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, for example, they protect all birds and mammals within the state. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, a private institution, which is uh, uh, quite legendary in the raptor community. That's Hawk Mountain. They do great work with uh, peregrine falcons and raptors in general. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, maybe donate or something like that, I mean, I can't be too specific, but those are some ideas that come to mind. That's great. Thank you so much. I want to thank mm -hmm. our audience for your questions. If you want to explore more about this topic you or other topics related to Pennsylvania, you can visit the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection website or the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. The links are in the chat box along with the link for the Falcon Cam. Thank you, Bert, for being part of this program today. Beth, it was an absolute pleasure, and uh, I wish everybody um, a wonderful spring and summer of getting outside. Fantastic. Thank you. We hope the audience will join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs. Visit our website for program information and to sign up. Today's program was recorded and will be available on the PHMC YouTube page.